chatbots and legal expert systems presented by um, Tom Martin. Let me give a brief introduction. Tom is um, the founder of LawDroid. Uh, LawDroid is a Facebook Messenger app designed to help entrepreneurs solve their legal problems. Um, it basically it helps you, assist you um, um, with all the necessary forms uh, through an expert system to fill out a uh, your LLC done in California. Tom um, is a Yale philosophy major, lawyer, techno Billy, entrepreneur. Um, he's also the managing attorney of Foresight Legal, um, an ARAG network attorney, and chair of the educational subcommittee of the Group Legal Services Association, an ABA affiliated organization. Tom is also the co-founder of the Vancouver Legal Hackers. And if there's anything I miss, Tom, you can <laughs> fill it in. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Miguel. I'm I'm really thrilled uh, to be presenting today. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff being juggled every day. Um, but I think one of you know one of the best things that I'm a part of is actually your program. Um, because it really involves the the future, you know, and being able to connect with um, law students and give them some insight into my experience and what I think the future holds for us um, is something that can really help them moving forward. Uh, I, I meet with a lot of uh, established lawyers. I just got back from a conference for Group Legal Services Association that was held in Scottsdale, Arizona, and um, you know I gave a presentation there about the future of legal services. And um, you know when you get a lot of questions, you get a lot of concerns from the the more established lawyers about how this will affect their existing business. And so I think by giving uh, law students this preparation, it really gives them a huge um, advantage to be able to kind of leapfrog um, into success versus more established lawyers. So, anyways, with that, I'll. Thank you uh, for. Yeah, you're welcome. I think you're doing a great thing here, and uh, I'm proud to be an advisor <laughs> with you guys. So, with that, let's let's look at the agenda. Um, you know, having this many things on the agenda, it's not going to be too slow paced, but um, if you have any questions, please let me know what those are. And um, I believe with one of these tabs, I can see them. Or if Miguel, if you could let me know what somewhere that stand out, I'd be happy to answer them either at the end or during or however we'd like to do it. All right, so the first is don't believe the hype. There is an incredible amount of hype right now around AI that this, for example, is AI that we've come so far that we have Android-like, you know, robots that are, that exist or that this is AI or we're here, hopefully not, you know, that we're going to have some dystopian future where AI takes over. I wish it was this, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and there's a lot of myths about AI right now, uh, with all these new news articles coming out and people talking about it, you know, that it's intelligent, that it could actually have some general intelligence about it. It doesn't yet. Uh, we don't have a general intelligence AI yet. Um, that it's conscious or that we have strong AI um, or that AI can be defined as any one thing. So what is artificial intelligence? Well. Intelligence is hard to define, but as far back as 1950, the godfather of uh, computers and artificial intelligence, uh, Alan Turing, he defined artificial intelligence in a practical way. What he said was, if you could have, if you could hold a five-minute conversation by text with someone, and through that five-minute conversation, 
you couldn't tell if it was a machine or a real person that the machine had passed the intelligence test. And that test, of course, is now called the Turing test. Um, as a philosophy major, I would point you back to 1637 when Rene Descartes, with his Discourse on Method, basically proposed the same test, uh, which is kind of strange coming from almost 500 years, um, well, 400 years ago plus. Basically, his philosophy was based on skepticism, and he said that there could be machines in the future that would be indistinguishable from people. So how would you be able to tell the difference? And so what he said was, well, of course you'd be able to tell the difference because whatever they would have to say, it just wouldn't connect with reality. It would sound you know, kind of off. It wouldn't sound like a real person, which is essentially the Turing test that he anticipated. The two uh, computer scientists that actually gave us the phrase artificial intelligence or John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky uh, from Dartmouth. Well, they had their first uh, conference, if you could believe it, on artificial intelligence in 1956 at Dartmouth. And they define artificial intelligence as the development of computer systems that perform tasks that essentially mimic uh, human abilities, like visual perception, speech re recognition, translation, and so on. Now, um, the, de the current definition that artificial intelligence is a programmed ability to process information, that's set forth by DARPA. Uh, and DARPA is a defense agency research project that is directed by John Launchbury. And there's actually a video on YouTube where he gives a complete discussion about the state of the current state of artificial intelligence. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's much, it's much more in depth than the prior authorities that I've mentioned on artificial intelligence because it actually gets in and breaks down, you know, what is intelligence? Yes, it's intended to mi mimic uh, human abilities, but what? You know, what is that? And here we see the perception the ability to perceive rich and complex information, to learn from that information within an environment, to abstract from the information so that, for example, there's different, you know, you have orange juice, you have a Coke or root beer, you have a glass of water, and a machine would be able to abstract from that that these are drinks. That would be abstraction. Or to reason is the ability to plan and to decide based on the information that's been received what to do in the future. So there's different abilities to uh, perceive, learn, abstract, or reason based on the type of artificial intelligence that use, is used and where we're at now as opposed to where we can be in the future is further explained in this uh, video by DARPA. So check that out if you can. So I'm going to give you some examples of AI, and the thing is, is that AI, you know, it's not something in the future. It already exists around us right now, uh, in in many ways. One is, uh, you know, facial recognition. Facial recognition is more basic than than identifying someone. It's just a matter of being able to gauge whether or not what the computer is looking at is a face or not a face, and. So the first way of doing it was pretty basic where the computer would look at the cross section where the eyebrows are and then the nose going down is kind of like a T formation so that it would look at it, an image and be able to see that there was this T formation of darkness and it would identify that as a face. Now that was good in 2001, but if somebody was turning their head sideways or if they were behind someone else, it may not recognize that image as a face. Well, in 2015, um, Farfade and Siberian, who are these two computer scientists, they came up with a machine learning al algorithm that was able to look at uh, 2 million images, uh, which included 200,000 faces. And from looking at all of those images, it was able to abstract the concept of a face. So it wasn't just this T section it was looking at, but it was being able to abstract about 
what is what is a face constructed of and able to identify that. So nowadays, you're able to recognize a face much more than you could um, 15 years ago. This, uh, this is a picture of me. <laughs> and this is actually a resource available uh, online by Microsoft. You just upload an image onto it and it'll tell you what the emotions are, more or less. You can see that the majority for me is neutral in this picture, and then happiness is a close second. But um, yeah, this mach machine learning AI is available currently, and I believe there's already a startup that's using this kind of information for jury selection. You know, <laughs> so if you can imagine having these uh, have cameras trained on the jury and being able to gauge how they're reacting to uh, questions. It would be very powerful in Wadir. Another application of AI is, of course, in Google search rankings. It takes into account what you're asking for and trying to gauge what you might be asking for. Um, and then it responds to your queries over time to get better at following your interests. Another current application of AI is when you write checks. Um, of course, it's physically impossible for human beings to review all of the checks and get them right. So computers have been trained to recognize the different digits and categorize them uh, correctly most of the time uh, to a high degree of, of uh, correctness. Uh, now AI is also, <laughs> this is obviously a, a fake with Homer Simpson having a crayon in his head, but the idea is that um, artificial intelligence can now be used to recognize patterns in terms of MRIs and X-rays. Um, and right now, they're being utilized as, um, as an assistance to, uh, to doctors that would read X-rays and MRIs to gauge what diagnosis they might come up with. And in many cases, uh, well, it's being experimented now that in many cases, um, the artificial intelligence can pick up a diagnosis that the image uh, reviewer would not be able to, uh, or at least at that rate would not be able to. Google Translate, um, if, if you have used it over the past year, you probably, you probably noticed a pretty big change around the beginning of this year. Uh, it used to do a pretty good job, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, and it's gotten a lot better by the employment of machine learning. Uh, before last year and before, it used a rules-based rules system to identify words and then replace them kind of like we would do by getting the dictionary and then just replacing the words and then using a basic grammar to try to keep things right. But by comparing uh, syntax and by taking examples of phrases that um, that have been fed into the system by, again, by repeated queries that people have had, it's been able to learn and abstract from that how to properly uh, put a sentence together in any language. And um, I remember reading that, that Google Translate has actually created its own meta language, which, is, it, which it employs to be able to translate um, sentences across languages. So it's... Um, become far much far far better and that's because of AI and machine learning um, whenever you go on Amazon you know it's comparing uh, your purchase to millions of others purchases and making recommendations based on your interests and what other people who bought things as you have purchased by the way right in the middle of that green book called data mining if you're at all interested in in machine learning um, I'd highly recommend it. It's a pretty good book by Ian Witten about mach machine learning tools <clears throat> and gives some practical insights into what it means and how to learn more about it. Some milestones in artificial intelligence. In 97, uh, we had Deep Blue uh, beat Kasparov. One of the, he was the best I, chess player at the time, uh, but he was beat by IBM's Deep Blue. And the level of complexity at that point in terms of 
the game tree complexity, like how many movements would be possible over the course of any game of chess was 10 to the 123rd power. So it was fairly complex based on the 9x9 nine nine grid that's that you play on in chess. Um, a different skill set was employed when Watson built the best Jeopardy contestants in 2011, which that's 14 years after Kasparov. Within 14 years, it was able to beat the contestants, this time not on a not on a static playing field because it wasn't a nine by nine grid. This was actually, you know, far ranging um, trivia. So it could be pretty much anything that would come up. And the way Watson won was by essentially taking uh, all the trivia possible into it, kind of like a blunder, and uh, just absorbing it uh, and being able to cross-reference all of that information within fractions of a second and um, and provide an answer. In 2016, which now this is only five years after Watson beat the Jeopardy contestants, um, AlphaGo by uh, Google DeepMind beat the best uh, Go player with now a game tree complexity of 10 to the 360th power. So this is orders of magnitude more complex than chess and um, was a breakthrough just a year ago. So how, what is an expert system? Um, how does this relate? The father of expert systems is Edward Feigenbaum, and what he defined an expert system as was a, a knowledge system which would allow the, a computer to offer advice and make decisions based on uh, inputted information from a user. And the interesting thing to me is that if you look at this, you know, expert systems were first created in the 70s. You had, you know, um, big computer systems like this that were used as far back as then uh, to provide um, a basic means of accessing artificial intelligence. And in some ways, it, was, it could be applied to fairly complex problems. But the way it was being applied then was rules-based entirely. It was solely rules-based. So it would, it, would, it would be along the lines, if this happens or if there's this condition, then you apply this rule. If this rule is applied, then this subsequent rule applies. And so this was first introduced at Stanford. And when Feigenbaum was talking about how this would progress over time, he talked about different eras of artificial intelligence, the first of which uh, was very rigid. When you were using that old school system we just looked at, it was very rigid in terms of the way you communicated with it. Um, if you got the wording wrong, it would, it would reject that inquiry. Uh, he foresaw the second era as being one in which speech would become the way that you interact with, um, with computers and gain access to a knowledge base. Foreshadowing this, uh, which I'm actually just getting a few of these. I'm kind of a <laughs> late adopter on this, but getting a few of these for my, my place. So what is a chatbot? A chatbot, it's basically a computer program that simulates a conversation. And if you talk to people that are familiar with expert systems, you know, they do go back quite a ways to the 70s. And they'll tell you that, you know, none of this isn't new. We've been doing this for a long time. They're called expert systems. I think the difference is in terms of the immediacy, immediacy and ease of use. Many people are saying the chatbots are the new apps, and that's because they're exploding in popularity and they're available everywhere. Some examples of them are uh, an app like this, Poncho. Uh, if you haven't tried it out, you go on to Facebook Messenger, you type in Poncho, it brings this up, and then you can ask it, you know, hey, what's the weather like? Or it, it'll actually auto-recognize where you are and be able to feed back to you what the weather is and 
whether or not you should wear a poncho out if it's raining. Another chatbot uh, that's an example of how you would use it commercially is 1-800-Flowers where you could type in uh, that you're going to a birthday party and it'll show you what's available for, for that. Uh, you put in the address of who you want to deliver it to or maybe pick it up and when and it will complete the order for you by just grabbing your credit card information that you may have in Google Wallet already. Health Tap is an advice type of chatbot where this one, it's, it's a little more intelligent because it uses natural language. It allows you to type in something like you would say to a friend, you know, my, my kid has a fever and a rash on, you know, on her, her neck. Um, you know, what does this mean? Like what, what kind of problem might that be? And then it, it will grab that general um, description find the keywords in it, feed the keywords through its database and give back two or three different um, diagnoses or two or three different um, ideas of what this might be. And of course, the idea is that you take this to your doctor and not rely solely on health tap, but you get the idea. So artificial intelligence and chatbots, it basically works like this. First, you have an inquiry from a user. As stated here, you know, when is this next train coming by? That request is fed into a natural language processing tool, like Watson, for example. There's different la natural language processing tools out there. There's Watson, there's Amazon Lexa, excuse me, Amazon Lex, that they use to create Alexa. There's API.ai, and there are many, many others that are more off-the-shelf solutions for, for natural language processing. But IBM Watson and ABI, excuse me, API.ai uh, and Amazon Lex are probably the more popular ones. So it takes the question and breaks it down so that it understands what is being asked in that question. It creates this structured data in number three that the person is asking about this local train uh, and when is it, you know, when is it coming. It feeds that request into a database, step number four, and then retrieves the information. Oh, well, the next one leaves at 437. Would you like to try another? So that's essentially how the circle of uh, request works in a, in a natural language processor. So rule-based AI, which is the kind of AI that we were talking about in expert systems, it runs like this. Basically, you could create a flowchart flow out of it and run down all of the possibilities. And most, um, most chatbot developers actually employ this system. They'll create a flowchart diagram of how the conversation is going to play out so they could find dead ends and then fill them with actual responses or help menus, well, help text, so that the person won't get lost, or if they do get lost, it'll direct them to restart the dialogue or something along those lines. Now, machine learning AI, it's not an either-or pr proposition. In many cases, the machine learning is being used in conjunction with uh, the rules-based AI, but the be I think the best example is, is natural language processing. Um, you can use synonyms of, so for example, if, if um, you programmed into a, a conversation in a natural language processor that the person would be asking for some water or for a Coke or for a drink of some kind, it would be able to abstract that the person's asking for a drink so that even if they didn't give you the very specific answer um, that that you've programmed into the system, you would be able to use machine learning to abstract that the, you know, if somebody said milk, it would understand that they were talking about a, a particular drink and categorize it that way. So this question comes up a lot, you know, why now? Like, why does this 
makes sense now. Uh, why is this so popular? Why are we reading about this in the news uh, so much? And that's because we've reached a, a critical point where it's become cheap enough, easy enough, and widespread enough that uh, the popularity is exploding because there really isn't a limiting factor. And part of it, part of the interest comes from the fact that messaging apps have just, they've outstripped social networking apps at this point. So with that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of interest, there are many people on these platforms that are available for, they're used to messaging, you know, everybody, this probably, it's obvious to, to, to you, but everybody lives on their phone, right? You're on a on a bus or you're just walking around and everybody's looking at their phone. Well, it's because messaging has surpassed uh, phone communication and voice communication. The other reason is that many of the main players have gotten involved in chat platforms. You have uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all jumping in and creating their own platforms for the creation of of chatbots and artificial intelligence. And uh, I remember reading that Google is now making itself not mobile first, but AI first in terms of its uh, vision of the future of the company. And then amongst the messaging apps that are available, there's uh, intense competition between you know, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, and this chart is a bit old, but Facebook Messenger is now over over a billion monthly active users. A billion monthly active users. So there's a there's a huge demand for um, for messaging and a great opportunity in terms of using chatbots to meet that demand. This is also somewhat old at this point, from November of last year. Um, now, uh, Facebook, at its last conference, uh, I think it was two months ago, mentioned that they have over 100,000 chatbots that have been created on their platform. And this is uh, just a map of some of those uh, bots and platforms and uh, natural language processing um, apps that are available. All right, so we've been talking a lot about it, but how do you create one of these things? These are some of the platforms for creating chatbots. Um, the one that I would uh, recommend that you that you try out first because it's just easier and uh, kind of fun to use is ChatFuel, the one in the upper left-hand corner. It is uh, free, and you could just jump on there and create something on your own pretty quickly. Uh, this is a video you should watch. This kid named Scoot, uh, seven years old, he actually created his own conversational chatbot using API.ai. So watch out for this kid. He's going to you know, come up on all of this pretty quick. Um, but get, <laughs> getting back to ChatFuel, this is what ChatFuel looks, looks like. And you can see it's a pretty... Um, a pretty basic way to, to work on it. It, base, it breaks it into blocks. So you have these blocks on the left-hand side where you could define, uh, you know, different conversations based on it being help that's provided or stickers or a menu. Um, and then you can feed in uh, different cards. You could create a gallery of different images. You can create a text card that just has some text on it or feed in one image. Um, and then on the right side, you see what a welcome message looks like. As soon as the person pulls up your chatbot, which in this case would probably be on Facebook, it would, and this is kind of cool, it grabs the person's first name from Facebook because, of course, Facebook knows your name. So it just says, hi, John. I'm an AI-based assistant for TechCrunch, and it goes into the whole thing. Um, so that's what would come up for someone if they just went on to TechCrunch's chatbot. Uh, this, as compared to ChatFuel, this is API.ai. And so this is a little more complicated. It's uh, one that I really like. It lets you do a little more and lets you be a little more uh, specific about what you 
of what you're trying to say. Um, on the very top, where it says cheer me up, this is basically you're naming an intent. And an intent is the intent of the user who's talking to the chatbot. So for example, if the user were, were to say to the computer, hey, cheer me up, um, this intent would respond to that. And so that's why here, um, where it says, talks about the trigger sentence, if the user were to say, cheer me up, then you're, you get to define a response to that. Oops. And uh, then you can also add, uh, you know, machine learning to this so that depending on the responses it gets, it could uh, learn what uh, common phrases are or categories that you that the user uses in communicating with the bot. And at the very bottom, you see speech response. Um, that's where you actually get to define what the bot is going to say to the user. So here, I just want to show you, I've been talking kind of theory here, but want to show you something practical. So this is API.ai, and if you log in, I created a real simple bot just to show you how it works. This one's called JokeBot. And so the first one, this intent is defined as tell me a joke. Okay, so here we write down the user says, tell me a joke. Or maybe the user says, make me laugh. And so the intent is that the user wants this computer to make him laugh or her laugh. And then we go down to the text response and we type in knock knock. So we're going to be telling a knock knock joke. This here won't get into it too much, but the, this context is telling the next intent that the, the user has gone through this process here. And so we'll save that. Then we jump into step number two. And so you could see from the incoming context that the person first went through the first step and now is at this step, the second step which is who's there. So the user would say, who's there? And then the computer would respond, lettuce. And you might know where this is going, but if we jump into JokeBot, and let's just refresh so that we can make sure the bot is awake, type in, make me laugh. This bot, by the way, it literally took me, you know, about five minutes to set up, uh, just going through these different steps and setting up the punchline and the prior two intents. So I know this is inapplicable <laughs> to uh, legal questions on its face, but if you think about it, you could feed in frequently asked questions. Uh, so if somebody says, hey, how long does it take to get divorced? You could have this, that answer standardized and built into the system to respond. And it could work for anything like that. This, Bodroid, this is the uh, chat bot that Miguel had uh, made reference to before that I, that I created with some developers. And this is on Facebook Messenger and allows somebody to just go through this dialogue and essentially they can incorporate a, a, a corporation in California for free. So they just go through this and answer a number of questions. And as you saw, the very first, the very first question, well, the very first uh, disclosure from the chatbot is, look, I'm not a lawyer. But those are some of the possibilities that you have with, uh, with chatbots. And let's jump back on to the presentation. Oops. One second.
All right, so when you put that chatbot together, this is a, a typical type of diagram where you would want to diagram all of the various ways a conversation can go. Um, and you can find all of the dead ends and also, also it, it helps you to understand and anticipate additional questions you might want to include. For example, if you're explaining the divorce process, there's certain questions that might come up that are pretty standard that somebody would ask. And you could fill out a, um, a workflow like this that helps you to map out the conversation. So this kind of begs the question about the ethics of chatbots and not specifically with regard to legal right now, although there are a number of issues that could come up in terms of potential confidentiality issues. There's issues of uh, UPL, right, which was addressed by the bot saying, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, don't rely on me. Use the lawyer if you need a specific opinion. But this is more, more general. Uh, you might recognize this guy. This is uh, Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park. And if you remember from seeing Jurassic Park, he, you know, at this point in the movie, he's asking why, you know, scientists created dinosaurs. Like why that they're too busy finding out if they could create or bring back dinosaurs. They weren't asking themselves whether or not they should. And so that kind of moral question is one that comes up uh, which, with chatbots, or at least in the future, it will come up more. Uh, Shawis is a chatbot created by Microsoft. And it is, it's uh, exclusively available in China. And it's very good at holding a conversation and being able to have, a, you know, a, an average conversation that sounds pretty good as pretty convincing and may pass the Turing test that we talked about before. And if you have been reading through this dialogue that's on the page right now, you could see that this bot is fairly clever and, uh, and knows how to uh, keep, keep a person's interest. Now, the, the moral issue that comes up, I, I listened to a presentation by uh, Tommy Lewis, who's a tech evangelist for uh, Microsoft. And he does, uh, they do a lot of projects for chatbots right now. And one of the issues that came up was um, th that, they, that they found out that there was, I believe, an eight-year-old in, uh, in China that actually, I think it was a 10-year-old. But he had been talking to the, this chatbot, Xiao Eyes, between six to eight hours a day. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. And it turns out that this this kid is a latchkey kid, so he doesn't have, you know, much social interaction. And Xiao Eyes is really, you know, the majority of his social interaction. And talking to the bot six to eight hours a day, it, it makes you think that, you know, at what point does do the developers of the bot have an obligation to this kid? You know, what if something were to happen? What if there were a fire? What if you know, some stranger were to come into the house and during the conversation, you know, should Xiao Eyes be able to, to help in some way. Another example of, of this kind of ethical issue is, and I apologize um, up front for some of the language on here, but Taytweets was another, another bot that was released by Microsoft. And what this bot did basically was using that machine learning to learn from the people that were communicating with it. And it gave what it got. So over time, it went from, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, hey, humans are super cool, to just devolving into this uh, really angry, bitter, uh, hateful thing, uh, because that's what it was getting from the people that were interacting with it on Twitter. Um, so this is Tommy Lewis that I referenced before. And he has set down uh, some principles for AI that he employs with, with Microsoft in, in how they service their clients. And his number one rule is that he, he will only design uh, bots to assist humanity, not to hurt it. And the most obvious example that, that he had was, you know, about taking away people's jobs. 
So he gets approached by by people that say, hey, you know, these chatbots are great. Um, I run a call center. I can eliminate everybody's jobs and just have the bots, you know, do all of the question answering. And, and he wouldn't take that on because, you know, one of his first things is, look, this is designed to assist people, not to get rid of people. Um, another principle that he has is uh, informational transparency, that the, that information should not be opaque in the sense that when you go through a chat bot dialogue, a lot of that information can become opaque because you can't you can't go back in and change your answer, you know, you can't um, kind of change the path unless you completely restart the dialogue. So there's some concern there about that opaqueness. Um, another principle is to maximize the efficiencies and preserve dignity. This is kind of along the same lines as his first point. Um, number four, to ensure privacy um, so that when people speak with a bot and they have a reasonable expectation of privacy that that is kept. That's a promise that's kept. Number five is to have accountability so that to remove some of that opaqueness if there's something that goes wrong that you can um, that you can look back into that dialogue and you can pinpoint the point at which things went wrong and to hold accountable um, the people that coded that so that they can correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Last point is just like you saw with Tay tweets, garbage in, garbage out. So if 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 the bot is programmed with bias, it's gonna it's gonna show it's gonna present with bias and discrimination. So we have to be very careful to question our own assumptions and to look at what you know what kind of uh, you know, preconceptions we might be building into a bot and to try to avoid uh, avoid doing that in a way that could be hurtful to people. So what does the future hold, especially in relation to the law? Well, I put this up here because what we have right now, no, these are not the droids you're looking for yet. But the concern I get the concern I have is that I get this response a lot of times from people where they say, uh, you know, these chatbots, these, uh, you know, personal assistants like Alexa, they're not perfect yet. You know, it doesn't do this, that, and the other. It's not perfect. And they don't say that explicitly, that it's not perfect, but that's more or less what they're saying, is that it doesn't do everything for me. I call it the panacea objection. And people say it all the time in, in reference to different new techn technological innovations. And so, of course, they say this for bots as well. And my response to that is, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. There's a lot of good that chatbots can do, as long as we keep in mind that they're not perfect and that there are situations that we need to guard against. I think that we're just starting out and the future is very bright. Part of that is this the actual performance of computers versus the, that of human beings is at this close, to, is coming upon this inflection point where the generalized intelligence that I made reference to before is, is going to become available to computer systems. And, and at that point, um, you know, we're going to have to be keeping up with, with computers in terms of their intelligence and uh, it being able to do things much faster, quicker, and more accurately than we can. Now, it can do that already in a lot of things, but what I'm talking about is, is, is judgment and reasoning. Um, and so that point, as I'm sure many of you know, has been referred to as the uh, singularity, and um, it seems to always be projected within the next 20 years, but given the amount of progress so far, um, I think that's, that's pretty, pretty likely if not sooner than that. This article, pretty recent, two months ago, um, JP Morgan, it employed, um, it employed so, some algorithms to basically do due do, do, do diligence on a lot of uh, documentation. And the review of the, 
the documentation would normally take about 360,000 hours of lawyer time. 360,000 hours over 41 years. And that would be one lawyer working all day, all night for 41 years. So what this represents is the kind of, um, you know, volume review that normally back in the 90s would have hundreds of junior lawyers working on it to review all of this documentation. And this was taking, this was handled within seconds by, um, by this artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm that J.P. Morgan Chase used. Um, and this is a sobering fact. It's especially a sobering fact, I think, for more established lawyers because one of the critical ways that they earn money is hourly billing. The billable hour is, you know, the, the center, the centerpiece of profitability for most firms. And the thing is, is that with this, you know, I, I've had I've had conversations with more established established lawyers, and they and talking to them about AI, and they say, well, you know, that sounds nice, but I bill by the hour. You know, if I do what you're talking about, then I'm I'm not going to make I'm not going to make money that way. And yeah, that is true. But if if somebody who's hiring a lawyer knows about this, which either they you know, do know, or they're going to know very quickly. You can't hide from it, and so you have to take steps to get with this, to get ahead of it. I'm, I mean, what you all have the opportunity to do here is to is to play around with these things. Um, you know, create a chatbot. Um, think of how you can apply it to the work that you do, and see how you can change things to put yourself ahead of this, become an authority, become an expert, be able to talk to, to lawyers that are still trying to catch up so that they can understand how they can best use this. And it also opens it up for access to justice because there's a lot of use cases where people simply can't afford lawyers. And lawyers you know, don't want to do the work because they're just not going to get paid um, what they believe that they need. So if you create chatbots that can service people that can do it, you know, can provide that service either for free or at a very affordable rate. Many, many millions of more people are going to be able to have the advantage of legal counsel or at least legal information and advice that they wouldn't otherwise have at all. And so that's the opportunity that's available to all of you. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I think it's a bright, bright time for you guys, and I look forward to any of your questions and seeing how I can help. Great presentation. This is super relevant to a bunch of the stuff that we're doing here at Northwest Justice Project. We are working with Microsoft on a chat bot that will be based on our uh, Washington Law Help website, which gets over 2 million hits a year. And I just got done with a conversation last week over our attempts to automate the 200 new family law forms that were just done in plain language in the state. And unfortunately, they scoped out chatbots from the initial request for vendors out of really extreme fear of unauthorized practice of law. Could you talk right. a little bit about whether disclaimers are enough and what are some of the other strategies for trying to uh, deal with that particular objection because I see this as just an incredible piece of technology that it could help people so much more than the traditional branch tree logic interviews. Yeah, and I I totally agree. I, I the way I see it is that the biggest test case of all of this um, has been LegalZoom. Okay, it, it's it's made such a contribution to. Um, to this area by way of its own litigation <laughs> that it's it's had over the years with various um, you know state bar state bars and so when LegalZoom got out there and it started providing its um, its web-based uh, you know legal solutions and, and document automation and all of that of course that question came up uh, in many jurisdictions you know this is the uh, unlawful practice of law. What are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. 
Um, and LegalZoom very successfully made the argument and it had to fight very hard in, in a few jurisdictions. I think North Carolina was especially one of them. But, uh, you know, made the argument that this was the same as, as Nolo self-help books or, or, or software like TurboTax and that uh, as being software, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't trigger any of the UPL uh, concerns. And I think part of that has to, like, to, to a certain extent, you can still make the argument that, well, you know, what is the practice of law and whether or not it should be broader than, than the current definition is. On the other hand, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of strength to the fact that it's a, you know, it's a market-based argument saying this helps people, people want this help, and these rules are in place for one fundamental reason, right? These ethical rules are in place to protect the consumers. And so if that, if that fundamental concern isn't being triggered because the consumers are getting something they want, um, they're being helped at affordable rates, and they understand that this is not a lawyer type of service, then everybody's winning. Um, you know, the, the company's winning, the consumers are winning. It's not, prov it's not provoking um, any type of injustice or harm. And I think that same argument would be applicable to chatbots. No, I really like the, the outcome-based approach and that we should give consumers the choice because then it's less about um, loss of uh, jobs or market share and more about meaningful access to justice for our clients. Exactly, and you know, the only, the only real counter argument right is hey well this is taking this is taking potential work from me as a lawyer but you know the lawyers the professional monopoly that that lawyers that we have it, it's not it's not in place for the purpose of making you know providing us with a living although I wish it would continue like like that indefinitely it'd be nice but it's not for that purpose it's its sole purpose is to protect consumers and so that argument it just doesn't fly, and it especially doesn't fly in jurisdictions like my home jurisdiction, California. Um, over the years, it's it's proven itself to be very friendly to um, to companies like LegalZoom, and also creating new categories of of uh, like document assistance, where y you can have people that have not gone to law school and have not been licensed prepare document legal documentation for um, for consumers so long as they you know make sure that they don't provide legal advice um, but then there's also a question there as to where, where does that line cross in terms of what is legal advice versus legal information so if somebody wants to start playing with this technology what is the one first resource that you think that they should go to? Is, is it an article? Is it a website? Is it an interactive tutorial? Where should they go to get the hands-on and start playing with it? Yeah, my first recommendation is, is uh, Chat Fuel. And by the way, I'm very sorry. I just, know, <laughs> I just figured out how to see the questions. And I'm happy to, to run through them if that's OK, or how do you prefer I do it? Uh, definitely, if there are some new questions here, I mean, they're not showing up on my screen, but if they are there, go for it. Oh, um, oh some of there them is might be the prior one. Hand who has hand raised also who does have a question to ask, which I can unmute here. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, has attendee is self is muted by an organizer. I'm attempting to unmute, and it's not working. Oh, now it's working. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, hi. Um, so I guess my question is, since it seems as though if you're creating a chatbot, you also, I mean, to a certain extent, we can kind of create a closed universe. So um, when it comes to navigating um, the possibility of, like, violating someone's privacy, right, but also trying to collect enough data so that way you actually can create like a meaningful a meaningful conversation and make sure that you're like exploring as many avenues as possible when it comes to the questions that might um, come in. 
Okay, so, I mean, is your question about, like, where do you draw the line for privacy? Yeah, or? that's my question. Well, I mean, the, the line, you know, metaphorically and literally is, is drawn in, um, in privacy policies. And if you define the relationship at the, at the front end as one where it's not an attorney-client relationship, then, then that, you know, gets you to a certain extent opted out of the, the attorney-client ethical rules for, for in terms of privacy, and then you can use a privacy policy to define that relationship as does any other company. Um, you know, it's a matter of disclosing clearly what the information can and cannot be used for. Um, I think even if it were, um, you know, uh, attorney-client privileged information, um, that the general, in, like the non-identifi non-identifiable information could be used. I mean, lawyers do this all the time when they talk to each other about cases they're working on. Um, and they try to get, you know, advice from each other about how best to approach a case. Uh, they, of course, aren't specifically identifying who the client is, but they talk about the, you know, the, the part of the case that they need assistance on. And, and in, a simil in a similar way, you could use um, the general information about the case to uh, abstract from that case and others like it uh, what the best solutions are for similar cases. Does that answer your question at all? So another question here, with these algorithms, um, they're often a moving target. The traditional idea to audit them has been uh, to just open source C code and then look at it. But if you've got algorithms that continue to move, um, how do we check those for, uh, for accuracy, for outcomes, and for transparency to make sure that they aren't reinforcing the norms or biases of material or uh, case stuff that we give them? Well, the key to that lies in the fact that that it, you're creating a, a large amount of data with each interaction and each conversation. Um, and actually, if, if you think about it, like at, at, at first blush, it seems like a like a like a fear that is intrinsic to this kind of interaction, like a bot interaction or conversation. But if, if you think about it, there's been millions of times um, that people have talked to each other, like an attorney or a, let's say a, a, a junior associate might talk with a client where there's been some kind of interaction advice and possible use of bias, but it's been absolutely impossible for those interactions to document or understand how, you know, how that happened or why it happened or, or correct it until you get a big, you know, usually what happens is you get a pretty big complaint, right, from a client and then you, you try to correct it in that way. Well, in this way, it's it's quite different because every single interaction between a consumer and, and the bot is documented. And every single um, algorithm in terms of, like, what, what was the intent, you know, like we looked at before with an API.ai, what was the intent that was applied to that specific request from the user? What specifically was the response of, of the bot to the user based on that intent? At what point in the you know, chain of dialogue did that occur? Um, did machine learning, was that employed on this particular response? And if so, you know, what assumptions were made in, in employing it? And, and, and so what, what you actually get from this, this approach is a deep dive into what exactly happened. You, you have the data available you can figure these things out to, well as best you can like much more so than you could in a in a analog version of people just talking so I, I I think the system has the ability to build in uh, much greater protection than than the uh, traditional way so we collect all of the interactions and then create an ethics bot to go back and look at whether the <laughs> is acting ethically well, 
if you're you know if you're doing it right um, and if it is a bot that is subject to all the attorney ethical rules then hopefully you would be baking that stuff into the bot in the first instance so that it would have these you know flags that would come up or it would have concerns that maybe if it if it hits some complex situation that through an ethical red flag it could basically hand that over to um, a lawyer to handle if it was the kind of uh, bot that was subject to attorney ethical rules. I have a question, uh, Tom. Uh, with the advent of, of growing machine learning, you know, uh, artificial intelligence like bots, and and just the lack of diversity in the legal profession, um, can these bots, like how how concerned should we be? with these bots carrying uh, implicit bias. I know I've read some stories about racist algorithms uh, in the criminal, uh, what is it, pre-bail context, and uh, you, you briefly touched on it. Um, what is this, how do we prevent it? I know you, 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 you kind of touched on it, but um, is it just the, the inevitable for, for implicit bias? I think to a certain extent it's inevitable because m many times uh, people, you know, good-meaning people are they're just not aware of their bias. It's it's just you know it's it, it's some many times something that people just aren't consciously aware of. So just by force of reasoning, if they're not consciously aware of the bias, then that bias is going to find its way into, a, you know certain underlying assumptions that are made and programmed into into code. Um, and and even if it's not programmed into the code, if if the actual algorithm includes a feedback loop like we saw in Tay Tweets, then it's possible for that feedback loop where the data is being is driving the evolution of how this bot applies, let's say the lot of facts then it could change over time too. So it's not it's not like a one-off question, right? It's not just about coding the first time. It's about maintenance and tracking and and I think the answer to all of this is as I mentioned before, it's it all it all comes down to the data. And and that's one huge different differentiator that we have now versus the past is that you can look at the data and you could see what are the actual outcomes? Who is this affecting? Does this look right? Does it, you know, and where you could actually have people making that call and and then doing their best to keep things going in the right direction. Did I answer your question, Miguel? Yeah, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I believe Aventura, she has another question. Uh, oh, never mind. Oh, well, if there's no more questions, let me check the questions one more time. Yeah, if there's no more questions, uh, I just want to thank you again, Tom, for taking the time. Oh, we got a question in. All right. Think... Oh, never mind. <laughs> All right. Is this a new question? Uh... One second. Hey Brian, is this a new question or do we already 
Uh, I believe yourself. that was the response to whether the previous question was answered. So I think we're good. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much again, Tom, for taking the time out. Um, really appreciate it, and we're definitely going to um, be connected and follow up with you over the summer. Um, there's going to be a, a really cool project over the summer where uh, the fellows will be uh, creating their own chat box. Um, That's awesome. And um, we will definitely look forward to your advice. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, and if anybody wants to, you know, c connect with me on uh, Twitter, my handle is Lodroid1, as you see here on the slide, and, um, you know, feel free to follow me, I'll follow, follow you back, and then if you ever have any questions, I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Tom. Excellent, yeah. thank you so much. I, I really look forward to doing more stuff in this space. Cool. Me too.